I want to begin where we stopped yesterday, namely, immediately after the encounter of Peter and the other disciples that the fig tree had withered. Jesus interprets that withering of the fig tree as the conclusion or the consequence of prayer. And so in chapter 11, verses 22 to 25, he gives the disciples a lesson in prayer. Included in the lesson in prayer was a lesson in faith. And faith interpreted here as believing before what one was praying for would be received and it would be yours. So in other words, it might be termed as believing before one could see or even experience. We saw this in the case of Jesus himself when he enters, or rather before he enters the house of Jairus, when he told the people at that time, the girl is not dead, she's only sleeping, it was not because he had any foreknowledge. It was not because he had thought that the girl is in a coma or merely unconscious, but because he had faith. This is why he could make a statement even before he could see. So now, when Jesus invites his disciples to do the same, he is inviting them also to behave in a way like him, as he has shown in that behavior there. Even here in the Passion and Resurrection predictions, we noticed that while paradidomi was used as a passive verb to indicate that Jesus would be handed over and God was in charge, but human beings would do what had to be done. When he speaks about the resurrection, it is always and all the three occasions in the active verb. The active verb is used only in Mark to indicate that Jesus has faith in God. So his faith prompts him to believe even before it can happen and it does happen. The second point that Jesus makes in his lesson on prayer is the point about forgiveness. Forgiveness is required because when a person prays, there must be no block in one's heart. There must be no negative emotions in one's heart. There must be no things which will prevent a person from being open to God. And lack of forgiveness can do that. As a matter of fact, a little deeper reflection on a question of forgiveness will make us realize that there is really nothing that we need to forgive. When does a person we think need to forgive? And if you reflect on this, you will realize that it is almost always when the person in question has not behaved as we want the person to behave. Either a person has not kept a promise, the person has not responded in a particular manner, the person has not spoken in a particular manner, the person has not acted in a particular manner, the person has not behaved as we thought they would behave, a person has not been grateful as we expected them to be grateful. So in almost every single case, the reason why we think we need to forgive is because we expect the person to behave in a particular manner and the person has not. And that has hurt us. That has upset us. We think we have been betrayed and so we need to forgive. If we go through John chapter 8 verses 1 to 11, we get a beautiful lesson in not so much forgiveness 
but in non-condemnation. There, a woman is brought who is caught in adultery. Already the loaded question is shown in their action. They only bring the woman when they ought to also have brought the man. If justice was the issue, both ought to have been brought to Jesus to ask the question. But the fact that only the woman is brought is an indication that they are loading the question. They want something more. They want to trap him. They want to test him. This woman was caught in adultery. What do you say? And the first time, Jesus bends and writes down on the ground with his finger. Even though a variety of interpretations have been given, the most plausible interpretation is that Jesus wanted to distance himself from the argument. He did not want to involve in the argument because he could see, he could experience, he could perceive that they had made up their mind. And how could he see that? Because only the woman is brought. If you're really serious about justice, you're serious about your question, you bring both the man and the woman. Why only the woman? So he wants to distance himself as if to say, if you have made up your mind, what more can I do? But when they insist, so the first time writing on the ground is to distance them. Don't involve me. I don't want to get involved. You seem to have made up your mind. When they insist, then is when he straightens himself up, issues a challenge, you might say, but very, very humbly. If any of you is without sin, let that person be the first to cast the stone. And then, here many forget, he bends down and writes with the finger on the ground a second time. And why does he bend down and write with his finger on the ground the second time? Because he does not want to condemn even the condemners. He wants to allow them to go with their dignity intact. He makes no judgment about them. That is the greatness of Jesus. He makes no judgment about them. He doesn't keep on looking even as they are going away. He doesn't keep on looking at them. He wants them to go with their heads held high. He wants them to go with their dignity intact. He wants them to go with their pride as they came. And then, this is confirmed in the question that he asks the woman. And notice the question, has no one condemned you? There's no question of forgiveness. Has no one condemned you? She said, no, then neither do I condemn you. So in other words, it is a non-condemning attitude which is required. And if a person does not condemn, then there will be no question of forgiveness. So in this text, it's a very beautiful text for us to keep in mind that Jesus is non-condemning, not only with the woman, which it would be expected given the Jesus we know, but he is non-condemning even with those who condemn the woman. He condemns no one. And that is what I say. When we talk of forgiveness, we need to ask ourselves, why did we condemn in the first place so that we need to forgive? And then we come to the text where because of the clearing of the temple, because of the preparation of the temple for true worship that is another way to interpret that incident of chapter 11 verses 15 to 19 the clearing of the temple so that true worship could take place that incident has upset the religious leaders and the three groups are mentioned here and this is the question about his authority so the three groups are basically the ones who 
he had spoken about earlier the first passion and resurrection prediction who would reject him and then would hand him over to be crucified so the authority which he they asked him about is what is your authority and where do you get your authority from so in other words how is it that you're expressing this authority because you may have got it from somewhere so from where have you got this authority in response jesus asks a question but i would interpret this question as a rhetorical question what do i mean by a rhetorical question i mean a question in which the answer is contained so it seems that jesus is asking a question as he himself said i will ask you one question by what authority do i do this thing that i will inform you and the question that he asks them is the baptism of john so therefore where did john's baptism come and they do not see it as a rhetorical question because what they ought to have realized is that jesus was talking about his own baptism that's what i mean by saying it seemed like a question but it is rhetorical in other words what jesus was doing is by asking the question about john's baptism was saying that he got his authority from the baptism of john or at the time of the baptism of john the ones who were asked the question are unable to answer either here or there and notice when it is a question of yes or no it can become very difficult for example supposing i were to ask you this question and i would say to you you can only answer yes or no there are only two answers yes or no and i say to you have you stopped drinking if i were to ask the question have you stopped drinking now if you say yes people will say you were a drunkard before if you say no people will think that you are still drinking sometimes when a person is married they ask have you stopped beating your husband or they ask the man have you stopped beating your wife say yes or no only yes or no a person says yes that means the person was beating before the person says no the person continues so jesus asked this question in this particular manner this is so they are arguing is of no avail they cannot answer yes they cannot answer no they cannot answer from heaven they cannot answer from human beings and then they answer at least they answer we do not know now instead of remaining silent we remember chapter 3 verses 1 to 5 when jesus asked the question there in the synagogue when he is about to heal the man with the withered arm they remain silent here they respond they say we do not know so then jesus respond in a similar manner that if they are not willing to talk about the authority neither will he but in a way jesus actually has answered but the reason why he does not tell them i got it from the from the baptism of john is because if they did not pick it up and if they interpreted his rhetorical question as a question to be answered and in this manner then they would not really believe if he said that he got his authority at the baptism as a matter of fact we might remember in chapter 1 verses 21 and 22 a little after the baptism of jesus and just after jesus calls the first four disciples mark makes a comment about the authority of jesus there and he tells us that he entered the synagogue and taught and people were amazed because he taught with authority and not as their scribes 
So very clearly, if the scribes knew because they had learned, if the scribes had authority because they could teach the law, Jesus' authority went beyond the law. He taught with authority. He did not teach the law, but he taught how to interpret the law. The second incident after the first controversy or the center of this particular chapter, we are in the first chapter of the Jerusalem section, the center is this parable. This parable, which is known variously as the parable of the murderous tenants, the parable of the vineyard is a parable which has been interpreted in a variety of ways as we shall see. However, in the telling, that is in the manner in which Mark has narrated the parable, it seems to have been allegorized already in its telling by use of the words beloved son and we might go back to Mark chapter 1 verses 9 to 11, Mark chapter 9 verse 7 and so on. <coughs> so once again, for the second time, the first time was in chapter 4. Now here, even though he speaks to them in parable, we will see later that Jesus actually gives the lesson. That's why I said the parable seems to have been allegorized. And we will see what the meaning is if only the parable and not the explanation were taken. Then is now within the temple precincts. And so therefore at the end, we will realize who the them refers to. It seems that since it follows from the chief priests, the scribes, and so on, it seems that they were the same audience because this follows immediately after that incident where they ask him about his authority. Now notice, even though originally the parable begins with a man, so it could be a landowner, could be somebody who owned the land, landlord. He planted a vineyard. Now the planting of the vineyard is in a way from Isaiah chapter 5 verse 2, but also indicates that he made it ready. So the vines have already been planted. So the main work is done. leased it out to tenants and went to another country. Now, this absentee landlords was quite common at the time of Jesus. There were people who owned large tracts of land whom they would give out in tenancy or on hire and they would collect the produce when they came or the family would collect the produce. The leasing very clearly is with the expectation of return on investment. So a person would lease it, not give it as a gift. So the lease already is expecting either rent in cash or in the share of produce. So the description of the vineyard indicates to us that the owner has done everything required. The tenants have only got to tend the vineyard. Only tend the vineyard. And so his share, that is the return, is expected. And he sends his slave. One slave is sent now because it is a small job to be done. What did they do? They seized and beat him. So very clearly, it seems absurd behavior. Why would they do that? Did the slave misbehave? What exactly did the slave communicate to them? The owner is not really sure. 
again he sent another slave maybe this slave never communicated to them maybe they did not recognize him maybe they did not know what he wanted but the second one notice little more now they beat over the head so beating over the head is more an insult and mark adds also insulted and then as going on going on they even more violent sending another one so the owner is wondering and yet the owner does not give up the owner gives the tenants the benefit of the doubt so when another one is sent they kill that one now here when mark says and so it was with many others some they beat and others they kill it's an indication of on the one level you might say the patience of the landlord but on the other level you might say it is the foolishness because when you send one they beat him up he could be misunderstood you send another one they beat up could be but the third one when they kill and all the others who said what exactly are you trying to do you can ask the landlord but if we look at the patience of the landlord we can understand it maybe they will tell and then finally we can see that after all of this he had a beloved son so this beloved son seems to resonate or mark wants us to remember and that's why i said this parable has been possibly allegorized already in its telling so very clearly when mark uses this word agapetos beloved son we will we automatically go back to when the voice called jesus beloved son and when the voice at the transfiguration pointed to jesus as beloved son they will respect my son however they treat the son in the worst manner because very clearly they want to own the vineyard and so they seized him they killed him and notice they threw him out of the vineyard in matthew and luke they throw him out and then kill him there because as far as matthew and luke are concerned the killing was seemingly or the crucifixion was done outside the city in mark the throwing out of the vineyard seems to indicate the disposal and when we come to the passion narrative we will see that this is just a disposal of the corpse in these covid 19 times many families are going through this experience with their loved ones there is no opportunity to give even a decent send off a decent burial the body is wrapped in a shroud and so very often in countries it is not known whether that is really your relative or somebody else because there are so many bodies so we can resonate we can understand something about mark is trying to say in our own present situation and this is the case of being thrown largely of the poor and then jesus asked the question and this is what i mean by supplying the lesson the parable ends and the parable 
ought to have been left as it is without supplying the lesson. However, because it seems to have been allegorized within its telling, Jesus asked the question and Jesus himself answers. And the answer is taken from the Psalm 118, which speaks about the cornerstone or the stone which was rejected. So the builders here in this allegory seem to refer to the religious authorities. They had rejected the cornerstone. But that stone has become the cornerstone. And so the reversal is striking when they realized that he told this parable against them. So notice the same group who challenged his authority, they wanted to arrest him. Now you notice, unlike earlier in chapter 4, verses 3 to 9, 26 to 29, 30 to 32, where the parable was told and the person had to apply the lesson him or herself. Here, the lesson is supplied. And that's why I said this parable has been allegorized in its telling. What are some interpretations given by those who think that if you remove the interpretation, it could be interpreted as a parable told by Jesus these are the interpretations. One, and this is given by Joachim Jeremiah, that God, who is the owner of the vineyard, God relentlessly seeks and searches for people. God will not give up. God is so patient, no matter how you might react, no matter how humans react, no matter what they do, no matter how much they strike God, God will continue to love. God will continue to be generous. God will continue to forgive. So when you look at the parable as such, and when we see, we keep on upsetting God. We keep on reacting to God. We keep on not giving God what is God's due. And yet God keeps on sending, keeps on sending. Forget about what Jesus says as the lesson. Don't take that into consideration. Only talk about how even the son is killed. Stop there and then interpret that. So this is one of the interpretations given. Another interpretation given by John, John Dominic Crossan is basically, this is what is required if you have to gain the kingdom. That is action like the tenants. You're willing to do anything to gain the kingdom. Violence also. The kingdom is what matters. The vineyard represents the kingdom. And so therefore, I will do anything to gain the kingdom. Whatever is required. If we go through Matthew chapter 13. Verses 30 following. We come across there the treasure hidden in the field. And there's a person working in the field. He finds a treasure hidden in the field. What did that person do? It's not his field. But he knows there's a treasure there. What does he do? He doesn't tell anyone. He doesn't tell anyone. He goes and sells all that he has and he buys the field. Now, was that dishonesty? Again, notice the focus is not dishonesty. The focus is the action taken. In Luke chapter 16, verses 1 to 8, Jesus tells the parable of the dishonored steward. The steward is about to be sacked from his job and calls the master's debtors and makes them make changes in the debt they owe to make it less. Is that dishonesty? That's not the point. The point is the action he takes immediately. So here, while it is true, there is violence, there is killing, there is beating. Yes, but the point which is being made according to John Dominic Crossan is that you must be ready to act. So these are some interpretations of those who look just at the parable as it is required. 
the kingdom will be taken away from false leadership and given this is now when you look at the interpretation which Jesus himself gives and Donahue sort of speaks about God relentlessly recklessly searching even though rebellious humanity earlier on I spoke about it as Jeremiah no it's Donahue who speaks in this way so God will keep on searching and I would like to believe that this seems to be the most plausible explanation of the parable as such. That God will never stop loving because God's love is not barter exchange. God does not expect that we respond to his love. If God expected that we respond when God loves, it would not be unconditional. Unconditional love is that which expects nothing in return. As a matter of fact, expects even ingratitude in return. And so therefore, the explanation of Donahue seems to me, if the parable is seen in isolation, it seems to me as the most plausible explanation. We enter now the fourth part of the structure which I had proposed you when talking about the first chapter of the Jerusalem section. This corresponds with the controversy of earlier, that is the controversy of chapter 11, verses 27 to 33, in which Jesus is questioned about his authority. Now, there will be a number of questions which Jesus is asked about a number of issues. And so there will be controversies here. Even though later, in chapter 12, 28, the scribe will not be against Jesus. The scribe will not be abusive. The scribe will not come to trap Jesus. There is also a question asked there. So now, one following the other, a number of issues are tackled in these sections. The first one in chapter 12, verses 13 to 17, is about taxes. There were customs tax, there were tolls, there were basically taxes which had to be paid, and all were unpopular. The direct taxes were collected by the Roman authorities, and the tolls, the excise duties, the customs tax, were given to Jews to be toll collectors rather than tax collectors. Here, the question is about what is known as the poll tax or the head tax. And the Greek was kensos, which is a Latin term for census. This was a tax which was imposed already when Judea became a Roman province already in 6 CE. That is a little after the birth of Jesus. It was the cause of revolt also. There were many, many problems with this tax and there were revolts, but those revolts were quelled quite easily by the Romans. And so the tax still existed. So the Pharisees here now are sent to trap him. And once again, they come with the Herodians. We met the Pharisees and Herodians in chapter 3, verse 6, where we were told then, that the Pharisees went out with the Herodians to plot how to destroy him. We also remember in chapter 8, verses 11 to 13, Jesus warns his disciples about the east of the Pharisees and the east of Herod in chapter 8, 14 to 21, after they come and ask him for a sign in the earlier verses. So they possibly refers to those whom Jesus had silenced already earlier in the question of authority and about whom he had told the parable, namely the chief priests, the scribes and the elders. So they were, Pharisees were a group, as we saw, separated ones who were concerned about law. Herodians, because Herod, was an ally of Rome. So anyway, Jesus would get caught 
one way or another, if he said pay the tax, they would accuse him of being on the side of Rome and against the Jews. If he said don't pay the tax, they would have accused him of being on the side of the Jews and not the Romans and so instigating trouble. And so therefore very clearly the trapping or the intention to trap is seen in the preface. They try to raise him up. I mentioned this earlier at least on two occasions. But I want to mention it again in this context, namely chapter 9 of the Gospel of Matthew, verses 32 to 34, where Jesus has healed a deaf mute and the two responses. So one of elation, one of praise, one of pulling down. Here, they try to prop Jesus up. And we must keep in mind about this. So while it is true that they may have been sincere in their regarding Jesus as sincere. Because it was true what they were saying. So they were saying that Jesus showed no deference to anyone. He regarded everyone on the same level. Only God was above all. Human beings are all on the same level. And he's teaching the way of God as he believes it. And because they speak about truth, they want to know whether it was lawful to pay taxes or not. And then the question once again, should we pay them? So it refers to the annual poll tax or the head tax <clears throat> or what was known as the Kenson, which was basically census. census. So Jesus is aware <clears throat> that it is a trap. And so what does he do? How is the poll tax paid? It is paid in Roman coinage. Not in Jewish coinage, not in Greek coinage. It is paid in Roman coinage. And that's why he asks for a denarius. A denarius, according to Matthew, was a day's wage and quite a good amount of money. So they brought one. And what would have been on that denarius, Tiberius Caesar Augustus, son of divine Augustus, they would have been the image or the icon. The icon would be the head of Caesar. And the epigraph, what was written down, would be this Tiberius Caesar Augustus, son of divine Augustus. So when Jesus looks at the head, he asks, whose head is this? So it's Caesar's head. Then he turns the coin. Whose title is this? Caesar's title. So very clearly, you have to give to Caesar. What belongs to him. This is his head and his title. So give it to him. However, this could be interpreted by the moderates to say that Jesus is telling us that human beings cannot be given to Caesar. They belong to God. Because Jesus could have stopped by saying, give to the emperor the things that are the emperor's and he would have answered the question. But by adding to God the things that are God's, basically he would have been saying, what belongs to the emperor? The zealots would have interpreted in this manner. What belongs to the emperor? Nothing, because everything is God's. So in other words, what Jesus is saying, give nothing to the emperor. This is how the zealots would have interpreted. So in a certain sense, this is like a parable. If a person was against paying the tax, he or she would interpret the words of Jesus to mean, give to the emperor the things that are the emperor's. And according to me, who am a zealot, nothing belongs to the emperor, so give everything to God. So give nothing to the emperor. The moderates would have said yes, you pay these taxes, pay this coinage to Caesar, give it to him. But don't give the human being to God. The human being belongs only to, to the emperor. The human being belongs only to God. That's how two groups would have interpreted it.